and not being allowed to by the government. And over time, you know, the definition of, first of all, what is a religion, because a lot of people claim they're engaged in some religious activity or practice or belief, and the court initially uh, struggled with this, but ultimately came down on the side of, it's, it's whatever a sincerely held belief is that you have. So if you have a sincere belief that, that you are religious, then it is religion. So it doesn't have to be what was considered religion at the founding or anything uh, like that, and just you, as long as you have a, a sincerely held belief. Uh, so if you're a conscientious objector for, from going to war, um, it doesn't really matter what religion that's based on. That's a sincerely held belief. You can uh, claim a religious exempt, exemption for that. Um, the court has been generally a protective, oh, skipped ahead there on some slides, of um, free exercise claims historically by religious minorities like uh, the Amish or Jehovah's Witnesses who uh, were fired from their jobs. Uh, and denied unemployment benefits by the state. The court said you can't do that. You can't fire them because of their religion or because they refuse to work on their Sabbath and then deny them unemployment benefits. The courts also said that the Amish can't be forced to attend public high school um, if, and because you know, they want to opt out after junior high school because they don't believe it's good to send their kids to public high schools. They can do that. They can opt out as long as, of course, they gain the education on their own through homeschooling, and that's what the Amish do. So the court was protective of religious minorities initially uh, through the Free Exercise Clause, but now, currently, the court is protecting um, private companies that claim that want to claim religious exemptions from participating in otherwise valid laws. And the most recent example of that is the Obamacare uh, case, the Hobby Lobby case, where you know the, the, the company, right, Hobby Lobby, uh, doesn't want to have to uh, provide contraception, contraceptive coverage to their employees because they say it violates the company's, the owners of the company's religious beliefs. And the Supreme Court narrowly upheld that in a five to four decision uh, recently. And so um, this has opened the floodgates for a lot of private organizations to come out now, businesses, corporations, and say we shouldn't have to participate in a law that goes against our religious beliefs. And this is a prime example of the court becoming more conservative uh, over time. Now let, let's talk about the uh, free speech clause of the First Amendment. So that's it for religion. And that's a lot to talk about with the religion clauses. Um, but with regard to the First Amendment freedom of speech clause, uh, what the framers really intended there was freedom of political speech. And that means if you're saying something political, that is the most protected speech. There are other forms of speech that are not as protected, like commercial speech, advertising on TV, right? We don't see television advertisements for cigarettes, for example, because that's been banned, uh, and the court has said it's okay to ban that uh, because, um, the power, because of the power of advertising and because it's not political speech. Um, obscene speech, obviously obscenity, is, is, it can be banned by governments. Um, so the longtime standard in, in political speech cases was clear and present danger, and you probably heard about that, right? Oliver Wendell Holmes famously said in an early uh, 20th century case that you can't shout fire in a crowded theater uh, because that would create a clear and present danger. And that's a pretty speech-protective test. Uh, it means you can say pretty much anything you want short of that. Um, but in 1969, the court um, articulated the test a little bit further a little bit more in the liberal direction, a little bit more speech protective, and uh, said that the test isn't clear in present danger. It should be incitement to imminent lawless action. So if you're making political statements, um, anything short of inciting people to actually um, violate the law, you can say it. But if you say something that gets people to violate the law, then that speech can be shut down. So that's a very speech protective test, incitement to imminent lawless action. That is the test. That is the law today. Now, there's other forms of speech. There's symbolic speech like burning the American flag. Can you burn the American flag? The Supreme Court has narrowly held five to four. Yes, you can, because that's political speech. The guy in the case, Texas versus Johnson from 1987, was burning an American flag at uh, the Republican National Convention to protest uh, President Reagan. And that was a political statement. And so the court has said you can burn the American flag. But the court has said you can't burn your draft card because that's government property. And that interferes with uh, the running of the draft. Obscenity cases. Um, we mentioned, I mentioned a second ago that that is not protected speech, and the court has articulated a standard for what uh, can be deemed obscene and therefore banned and what uh, cannot. And it's whether the average person uh, applying contemporary community standards, so local standards, uh, would find that the work, whatever the work is, a film, uh, a book, whether the work taken as a whole, not part of the work, but the work taken as a whole, appeals to the prurient interests. Um, and prurient is, you know, lascivious, uh, that sort of thing. 
Uh, so that's the first part of the test. And then whether the work depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined uh, by the applicable state law, and whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, and scientific value. So, for example, you can't ban Franco Zeffirelli's film of Romeo and Juliet uh, because uh, it contains nudity in it, um, and the, uh, Ju the, the woman playing Juliet um, is you know, in the film, she's pretending to be 16 years old, but she's really an 18-year-old actress, uh, or the film American Beauty, the same thing. We have actresses who are uh, nude in that film who are really adults, but pretending to be high school students. And the court says this is, these are serious literary works, and so they cannot be banned, okay, because the work has to be taken as a whole. So obscenity, student speech. While students do have political speech rights, and you can uh, make political statements in school, uh, you cannot do that if it's disruptive of the learning environment. So the court has held as long as there's no disruption of the learning environment, you can go ahead and make political statements. If it disrupts the learning environment, then you cannot. You could be suspended. Uh, the speech could be quashed. Uh, campaign finance, of course, a very controversial area of the law uh, these days. And um, the court, as you know, has held uh, in the Citizens United case recently that um, corporations do have a free speech right, uh, private corporations, labor unions, uh, interest groups, uh, these private organizations can say whatever they want about uh, political campaigns. Um, so while the court allows restrictions on donations, direct donations to specific candidates, and the court has allowed those restrictions because of the uh, because of corruption, right, because of bribery, or because of the appearance of corruption, the court has said, because it looks like bribery, so they can limit how much money we individually can contribute to candidates. The court has said what we cannot do is limit the amount of money we can contribute to these uh, individual groups, these interest groups. Uh, if they want to spend, uh, raise money and spend it to promote particular candidates, they have a free speech right to do that. And obviously a lot of liberals are upset about that. Uh, Bernie Sanders, as you know, has been saying we need a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. And as you know, in order to overturn a Supreme Court case, you have to have either another case that overturns it or a constitutional amendment that overturns it. Okay, so that's um, freedom of speech. Now, freedom of the press um, is a similar area to freedom of the speech, but it looks specific. It, it deals specifically, of course, with the press and you know the newspapers and the television uh, stations um, that cover uh, politics. And freedom of the press is also not absolute. And so uh, the press can't publish obscene material. They can't publish material that compromises national security. They can't incite violent action. And student publications also do not have the same kind of freedom of speech as, let's say, uh, the New York Times does. Uh, again, because of the uh, disruptive learning environment and also because the court has held students simply do not know as much as professional journalists in terms of what can and cannot be published. And so uh, principals have um, discretion to uh, quash a student uh, press, um, student newspapers and those sort of things if they feel articles are not appropriate. Okay, So the press does have the freedom to publish virtually anything they want about public figures, those people who are in the public eye like politicians and celebrities and so forth, but the press may not publish information that they know is false. If they do, then libel suits for monetary damages may result. So if the press knows, if the New York Times knows that what they're publishing about Donald Trump is false, then Donald Trump can sue the New York Times for an infinite amount of money, all right? But he, Trump, would have to prove that the New York Times knew it was false. And so that's the test. It's a very difficult test to prove. So you can see the test down there at the bottom of the slide. Uh, the, the, the statement has to have been made with actual malice, meaning we were trying to harm this person, that is with knowledge that the information was false, or with reckless disregard for the truth. We didn't even try to figure out whether it was true, we just published it. All right. That's why journalists are always trying to get two sources or more for everything they publish. Then they can make sure that they can't be sued for reckless disregard for the truth. They can believe that what they're publishing is true because they have two or more sources. Okay. So there are some limits on freedom of the press, but not a lot. The press is pretty free. Now let's talk about the final area of uh, freedom of assembly and then and petition. Um, and you know, again, we talk about balancing right the right to assemble and the right to petition the government against the police power of the state to protect the health, safety, welfare, and morals of the people. And generally, the Supreme Court has been very protective of the freedom to assemble 
in open public forums like public parks or streets or sidewalks or town squares or the seat of government. So that's why you often see people marching on the Capitol in Washington, D.C. or on the Mall in Washington, D.C. These kinds of areas because they are public and they are government public spaces. And so uh, if you're protesting there, you can uh, feel uh, pretty uh, self-confident that you have the right to do that and, 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 and your assembly cannot be stopped. However, in limited public forums, and the court has said a school is a limited public forum, and on private property like your front lawn, let's say, the court has been less willing to extend assembly rights. So you can't protest uh, on the private property of a political office holder. You could try to stay on the sidewalk out in front, uh, but you might run into problems there too with the neighborhood. Better to go to the seat of government, right? The Capitol, the legislature, the White House, and protest there. Peaceful public assemblies at the seat of government have garnered the most protection by the Supreme Court as where demonstrations in and around less public forums and private property have been more likely to be restricted. Okay, so that's a brief uh, overview of the important areas of the First Amendment. And you can see that it's been a major point of contention um, because there are numerous provisions uh, in the First Amendment and each one of those is controversial to be sure. The court's record has been mi mixed in a lot of these areas, and that because, that's because the justices change. As we know, recently we have a, a new Supreme Court justice, Justice Gorsuch, and he is uh, a, a conservative, a very a strong conservative. And so uh, for the rest of your lives, he'll be on the Supreme Court voting in the conservative uh, uh, direction, which is to accommodate religion, uh, which uh, you know is, is certainly one of those controversial First Amendment areas, for example. Indeed, they just heard a case uh, involving... Uh, the Establishment Clause on Justice Gorsuch's first day on the court. And the case um, involved whether or not public funds, uh, government funds, could be given to religious schools to resurface their playgrounds uh, with, uh, you know, rubberize the playground. So instead of asphalt, we would put these crushed up old tires uh, into this rubberized playground. All the public schools got the rubberized playground, but the religious schools didn't. And so the religious schools have brought a lawsuit and says that this is uh, say that this is unconstitutional um, to deny this to us. And um, it looks like the court is probably going to agree with them and, and, and rule that there can be, again, aid to religious schools, this time in the form of money to put in a rubberized playground on religious uh, phrases. Uh, I see uh, uh, the question is about the incitement phrase again. And, and that's the First Amendment freedom of speech test for political speech. The phrase is incitement to imminent lawless action, right? And so lawless action, um, we know what that is, right? People getting out of order, um, fights, destruction of private property, and then imminent lawless action, meaning it's happening, it'll happen right now. As soon as I say this phrase, it's going to happen. Imminent lawless action. So if I give a speech inciting people, right, to get out of order or to destroy property, the police can come and arrest me because I'm inciting imminent lawless action. And so that is the test. Now, if there's nobody around, you're not inciting anything, you can say whatever you want. Um, and, and if, you know, nobody gets out of order, you can say whatever you want. And so what a lot of people do um, is try, if they don't like what the speaker is saying, they try to get out of order. They try to uh, create violence. They try to destroy property so that the police will come in and shut down the whole event and stop the speaker from happening. And that is a, an interesting game that's played out with regard to the First Amendment. Okay, so um, any further questions uh, about the First Amendment before we move on to the Fourth Amendment? I, I've seen uh, there have been some questions in the box, but we have a, a couple minutes to answer any more. I know we've covered a lot. And it's, uh, it's a lot to take in. The First Amendment covers, as we, as we just saw, many provisions. You know, it, it takes me an entire semester uh, to teach all of that to my students and go over all the constitutional law cases. So what we just covered in 20, 25 minutes, normally it takes 16 weeks of college to cover. Um, so you have a kind of broad overview. So the question is, what could be a revision to the Lemon Test? Well, that's a really good question because um, the Lemon Test uh, is controversial. Uh, I already mentioned that Justice Kennedy, who is the swing vote on a lot of these cases, the fifth vote, he doesn't like the lemon test. He prefers what he calls the coercion test. Coercion, right? Are students coerced into participating in religion, for example? So he struck down prayer before a junior high school graduation ceremony, prayer that was allowed by the school administrators and approved by the school administrators uh, to have a rabbi come and give the sermon. Uh, 
and Justice Kennedy said, this is coercive. Um, students don't have a choice of whether or not to attend a graduation. They, they want to attend their graduations. They're going to attend their graduations. And if a prayer is invoked, then they have to stand up and participate in it, or they have to feel like they're participating in it, and that's coercive. And so if you want to get Justice Kennedy's vote, and he's the fifth vote in a lot of these cases, and you need to make it clear to him that the program is coercive in some way in terms of promoting uh, religion. So that's an important test. There have been other tests uh, that justices have articulated. Justice O'Connor has a test called the endorsement test, whether the government is endorsing religion. Nobody uh, agreed with her for that test, and she's, of course, no longer on the court, so that test may not really be valid anymore. Um, I guess we'll see, because the court's going to be deciding in this uh, Establishment Clause case I mentioned about the rubberized uh, playground for the uh, religious school students. Uh, we'll see what the justices uh, do with regard to the Lemon Test and whether they'll use it or whether they'll uh, adopt Kennedy's coercion test to get his vote. Indeed, Kennedy might be the one who writes the opinion in the case, and he'll be talking about coercion uh, if, he, uh, if he's lucky enough to write the opinion. So anyway, the um, coercion test is the uh, kind of alternative to look for in the Establishment Clause uh, area. I see someone asks uh, about uh, freedom of speech. Um, yeah, no, this is actually a good one here about uh, the words in God we trust on the money. Uh, what the court has said in allowing that is the same thing with why they allow um, prayer before legislative sessions. The court calls that ceremonial deism, right? Um, deism meaning belief in a God, um, uh, you know, a higher power, and they're calling it ceremonial. That, that because it's been around so long, for hundreds of years, in terms of prayer before legislative sessions, or in God we trust on the money, that it's not really an re endorsement of religion, it's not really the government saying we are religious, it's just ceremonial. You know, it's sort of like if you're not religious, and you go to the town square, and you see the menorah, and you see the Christmas tree, and the baby Jesus in the manger, you don't think, oh, I don't agree with that religion, you think, oh, that's a cute little holiday display, just like Santa and the reindeer. It's kind of ceremonial. So that's what the court is saying with regard to the money, and that's why that's allowed. Same thing with prayer before legislative sessions. All right, so um, why don't we move along, because we are uh, due now to talk uh, about um, uh, the Fourth Amendment. Um, let's, let's move along to the Fourth Amendment. And, and oh yeah, I, I, before we move along, this is a good question from Mike about the uh, uh, Pledge of Allegiance. That's a controversial one, and, and what, you can, uh, what you'll see is at the end of this uh, PowerPoint, I have a whole bunch of extra slides down here that cover all these cases, including um, the uh, uh, Pledge of Allegiance case. And so you can look at those slides on your own after the webinar. But basically, the court didn't decide that case. Uh, they, they basically ducked it on some technical issue. Um, but some justices made it clear that they think that the Pledge of Allegiance is allowed and, and maybe it's for ceremonial uh, reasons, um, maybe not, but the court has not squarely tested that issue yet, whether the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, because it does say, you know, one nation under God, whether that's constitutional or not. Uh, generally, we can guess that conservatives would allow it and liberals would not, and right now, right, we have uh, Justice Kennedy as the swing vote. Um, what would he do? Uh, is the Pledge of Allegiance coercive, saying the word under God, or is that just ceremonial and students aren't really even paying attention anyway? Uh, but th that, that case has yet to be decided by the court, but I think it will be uh, in the coming years. It's just a matter uh, of time. Okay, um, so anyway, let, let, let's move along to the Fourth Amendment. Um, Fourth Amendment also a very interesting, important provision uh, of the Constitution. Uh, with uh, all kinds of uh, interesting parts to it. So um, the Fourth Amendment consists of two clauses, and both of those clauses deal with criminal procedure. And that's the stuff that we see on TV and the movies, right? All the stuff with police and courtrooms and trials in terms of guilt or innocent. Uh, that's what we call criminal procedure, the process by which we, um, you know, go after the bad guys, basically. So what does it say in the Fourth Amendment? It, it prohibits, first of all, unreasonable searches and seizures. So that means that the government can't simply search your house or task you to turn out your pockets or your purse to see what's inside. That would be unreasonable. They have to have a reason to do it. So uh, unreasonable searches and seizures um, are not allowed, and you know, searches and then seizures, right? Taking what you have from you. 
um, that is not allowed. But but only if it's unreasonable, right? If it is a reasonable search or seizure, then they can do that. Okay. So um, what is the what is that clause of the Fourth Amendment actually say? It says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, right? So that means you know you have some stuff in your pocket, right? Uh, you know that sort of thing. You're secure in your person, your houses, obviously that's self-explanatory. Um, your papers and effects, so the things that you're carrying and so forth, uh, against unreasonable searches uh, and seizures shall not be violated. That's the first provision of the Fourth Amendment. Um, and then the second uh, has to do with the procedural details for issuing search warrants, right? That's a warrant is a uh, order from a judge uh, who might, uh, if you know, the state wants to search uh, somebody's house, uh, they go to a judge, they ask the judge for a search warrant, the judge looks at the state's uh, evidence or reason for wanting the warrant, and if the judge thinks there is a reasonable, uh, you know, um, suspicion, a reasonable um, uh, idea, probable cause that, that maybe uh, the, there's a crime being committed or something, then the judge will issue the search warrant. Um, if not, then there is no search warrant being issued. So it says, no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched or the person or things to be seized. So the warrant, uh, when, when the prosecutor goes to the judge and asks for a warrant, they have to be very specific about, we want to look in this specific place or this specific person. It can't be a broad grant of authority that they're seeking. It has to be very specific. And it has to have probable cause. So the judge, is just, the judge says, do you have probable cause right, uh, to search? What evidence have you found already? What rumor have you heard? What speculation is there? You know, they can consider that, but, but it has to be probable cause uh, in order to get a warrant. So there are times where warrants are not allowed because there is not probable cause. And so the judge provides an important check against what we call overzealous prosecutors, uh, overzealous um, district attorneys or state's attorneys who would like to uh, search people without enough uh, evidence uh, to move forward. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what the uh, court uh, has done in this area. Uh, historians agree that the framers were particularly concerned about general warrants, and that's what uh, had been into effect historically. Um, these general warrants lacked the specificity for the persons or the places to be searched or the items to be searched. But the Fourth Amendment caused very little public or political controversy when it was enacted at the founding. Uh, it just wasn't that controversial. Um, which I guess makes sense because people, you know, don't like the government intruding into their private affairs. The Supreme Court didn't even begin to delve into the Fourth Amendment until uh, this 1886 case, Boyd versus the United States. So the first hundred years of the country, there really isn't any Fourth Amendment uh, challenges. And that's true of a lot of areas of constitutional law. It really doesn't happen until the 20th century with regard to civil rights and civil liberties that most of our um, uh, constitutional law is developed. So it's really relatively new in American history. So anyway, in that case, Boyd versus UA, U, U.S., the justices held that a requirement to turn over personal papers for a customs investigation constituted an impermissible search and seizure. So um, that was a, a protective decision uh, right, from the, uh, right off the bat. But one of the most litigated areas in constitutional law has to do with the question of when a warrant is necessary for a valid search and when evidence obtained without a warrant can be used in court. And that's a very important concept. Um, can evidence uh, that's uh, obtained without a warrant be used in court against you? And that has been a controversial area for the Supreme Court to try to figure out. Over time, uh, the justices have attempted to strike a balance between protecting the rights of individuals against illegal searches and seizures and protecting the community from possible danger, right? That's the idea. We want to get the bad guys. Uh, the court has generally required specific warrants based on probable cause. So um, these ideas of general warrants are not allowed, and if you don't have probable cause, then uh, you're not going to get a uh, warrant. Okay, so um, this idea of the physical penetration rule, this was the uh, Supreme Court's initial rule in this area of the law for the first 150 years of its history. And the prevailing view was that the Fourth Amendment did not restrict police searches and seizures unless law enforcement physically intruded on a person's property, right? Like physically going through a person's belongings or trespassing on that person's private property. So there has to be a physical penetration. If the government is not physically penetrating a property, then they can do whatever they want. 
and you can imagine uh, what this is going to lead to. Uh, in the case of Olmsted versus United States, um, the government used a wiretap, right? They didn't get a warrant. They simply went outside where the phone lines were and they put a wiretap on your phone. They didn't go inside your house and they listened in on all your conversations to hear if you were doing any crimes. And uh, they, 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 they heard some crimes. They prosecuted this guy and he brought a case to the Supreme Court saying this guy didn't have a warrant to eavesdrop. Uh, the, you know, the government didn't have a warrant to eavesdrop on me and so this is unconstitutional. And um, the court disagreed with that in Olmstead and allowed the government to continue to use wiretaps without warrants, warrantless wiretaps to eavesdrop on people because it didn't physically penetrate the house. And so the government had a good thing going uh, in the age of wiretapping. Uh, but ultimately, the court overturned that decision in 1967, and that's relatively recent. Um, no longer could a warrantless wiretaps be used. Um, the court said that all state and federal law enforcement agencies, they must obtain warrants prior to wiretapping. The court explained that search and seizure protections applied to people, not to places. So the physical penetration rule was no longer good law. All right. So um, the Katz decision in 1967 was important for changing the direction of Fourth Amendment law. However, the Supreme Court, as we mentioned before, has been conservative in recent years. And those conservative justices, increasingly conservative, have scaled back some of the um, exceptions to the idea that you have to have a warrant before you can search. And so the requirement um, you know, that police seek out a judge and show that they have probable cause in order to do a search and a seizure, the court has said sometimes that's just not practical. Sometimes time is of the essence, and you can't go seek out a judge. You've got to act fast. So the court has carved out a number of exceptions to the general principle that police should obtain warrants to conduct searches. At the same time, the court has also placed limits on those exceptions, and all searches, whether under warrant or not, must be based on probable cause or reasonable suspicion. So even if you don't have a warrant, you can't just go out there and wiretap people's phones or whatever. Okay, You have to have probable cause to, to do it, and even if you didn't, weren't able to get a warrant, let's say right away, or what the court has called reasonable suspicion, which is a little bit less of a standard than probable cause, but it means the police do believe um, something bad is happening. It's reasonable for them to have con concluded that. All right, so here are the seven most common ex exceptions uh, to this warrant requirement. Search is incident to a valid arrest. So if you know, the police arrest you, they can go ahead and search you and search the immediate area around you because of safety ideas, right? You might have a weapon on you, uh, you, you know, you might have uh, drug needles in your pocket that the police could get poked with and get harmed or something like that. Um, so uh, searches that are, uh, so if there's a valid arrest taking place, they can search the immediate area without a warrant at that point. Okay, then there's the loss of evidence search. This is a situation where the police have to act quickly to preserve evidence before it's lost um, or being or, or destroyed. Uh, if the evidence is inside of the human body, so a lot of people will swallow the evidence, and let's say it's illegal drugs or something, uh, the government cannot take you to the hospital and induce vomiting or force surgery upon you to find the evidence. Uh, the court has ruled that is unconstitutional. But blood tests are allowed. So that's a sort of variation on, on that theme. So if there's a loss, it's going to be loss of evidence or destruction of evidence uh, right away, then the police can go ahead and do a search at that moment without a warrant. Now, there's some more exceptions. Consent searches. Police can search if you give them consent. All right? Permission has to be given freely and voluntarily, um, and, and voluntarily granted, and the individual granting consent must have the authority to do so. So the police cannot coerce you, cannot lie to you. They cannot trick you into giving your consent. So if a police officer ever asks you, can I search your car? Do you mind if I come inside and, and look around inside your house? You know, they are asking because they don't have a warrant. And you can say no. And if you're not sure what to do, what you say is, is that a question? Is that a request? Or is that an order? Is that a request or an order? And if they say, well, it's a request, then you should say no. I always say no if the police ever ask me anything like that, right? Oh, you mind if we come and look around? You mind if we look inside this? Is it all right if we take a look? The answer is no. No, you cannot. Where's your warrant? Go get it. Not because you have anything to hide, but because they could plant stuff there. They could make stuff up. 
you don't know what's going to happen, right? You better not let them do something like that if they ask. But, you know, the natural thing is for innocent people to say, yeah, sure, go ahead. I got nothing to hide. And then who knows what might happen. Uh, there have been many, many cases over time where stuff happened, even though you were innocent, a police uh, drummed up some charge or found something to connect you with some crime that was bogus, and you were convicted of it. So be very careful, all right, to give your consent to police to search. Uh, safety searches. Police may pat down a suspect believed to pose a danger in order to find or remove any weapons or threatening objects. So you haven't been arrested, but, you know, you're a suspect and we can pat you down. You know, we're not arresting you. We just want to pat you down. Okay, that's allowed. Uh, they have to have reason to believe, though, that you pose a threat to safety. They can't just pat you down for any reason. They have to have, again, reasonable suspicion that you might pose a threat in order to pat you down uh, and, and insert you, that sort of thing. Okay. And then we have the hot pursuit exception, which is the police can pursue fleeing suspects in the areas where they would otherwise need a warrant. So if the suspect is evading arrest, they run into their house, you can run into the house after them and arrest them if you're the police. You don't need a warrant to go inside the house. Okay, that sort of thing. So the hot pursuit exception is allowed for police. You know, think about it. If you're going to become a police officer, you're going to have to go to the uh, training academy. And you're going to have to know all of this. Uh, you know, it's going to, you're going to have to study it. It's going to be on the exam. You know, this is how you become a police officer. You have to know this kind of law. Uh, the plain view doctrine is, um, uh, yeah, somebody, somebody's asking, well, what was the fifth point? Uh, we'll move back real quickly. That was the hot pursuit point, right? If, if you're pursuing a suspect into a house, you can follow them into the house. You don't need the search warrant, okay? The plain view doctrine is controversial, but it holds that if police are, um, are, are lawfully present in a location and uh, they see something that's openly visible, then they can seize those articles without any additional authorization. So if you're pulled over in a car, then what's the first thing the police do? They shine their flashlight inside the car. They want to see what they can see, right, through the windows. And if they see drugs or they see guns or they see something going wrong, that gives them reasonable suspicion, probable cause to search the car. Um, so hide your stuff, right? Don't leave anything in plain view because you never know when you're going to get pulled over. Leave it outside of plain view, in the trunk, in the glove box, that sort of stuff. And so that way they can't see anything, all right? So the plain view doctrine gives them the ability to search without a warrant if they see something that's suspicious. And then the final exception is the place searches. In general, the home is the most protected place, and other places have less protection, like open fields um, of land. Even if it's your own privately owned land, if it's an open field, you have less uh, expectation of privacy there. Um, because people can see it. It's just an open field, whether it's overhead from an airplane or from the side of the road, from a car, with some binoculars, right? But inside your house, people can't, right? If you're down in your basement, there's no windows. It's all blacked out. Um, that's, like, very private. No one can see in, okay? So there's no uh, exception for uh, place searches there. But prisoners in their cells, there's, no, there's less expectation privacy there. That's why the cells are open. There's windows. There's bars that you can see through. Um, um, so less expectation of privacy for prisoners. Um, inspections for customs border and airport officials. So if you leave the country and you come back, uh, the customs department can absolutely search your luggage uh, if they have some uh, reason to do so. It um, doesn't even have to be because of you. If they have a tip that on your flight someone is smuggling a bunch of diamonds into the country illegally, they can search everybody's luggage on that flight. Okay. So when you come back to the country, if you get stopped and questioned and they ask you, you know, you know, where were you? What are you doing? You have to take that seriously, okay? Because they can search you right then and there. You can't say, oh, you have to have a warrant, or I want to talk to my attorney. It'd be very careful there, right? You have less expectation of privacy when you're coming back into the country. And then car windows, uh, you know, those sort of things, right? Um, uh, automobiles, right, are another uh, area with low levels of protection, and that's because they are mobile, right? They can quickly leave the jurisdiction when, when, you know, quickly leave the area when police stop them. Uh, and car windows allow people to look in, as we mentioned uh, before. So there's a, you have a lower expectation there in your car. Uh, and then the government has a, a pervasive interest in regulating cars, right? We, we don't just let anyone get a driver's license. We don't just let anybody drive a car. You can't just drive as fast as you want or however you want uh, because it's very dangerous. And so um, there's less expectation of privacy for your car. And so routine traffic stops do not justify a search of your automobile, but if the police have probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed, then they may search your car. In another example, police may stop cars at checkpoints 
even if those checkpoints are merely informational. If police set up a checkpoint to say, you know, uh, it's New Year's Eve and we just want you to be careful tonight, um, you know, and, and then they stop every single car at the intersection just to make sure that you're careful tonight because there's a lot of people drinking out on the road. We just want to let you know to be careful or something like that. If they can see inside your car or, they can, or it looks like you're intoxicated, then, you know, you can be pulled over. So checkpoints are allowed and uh, checkpoints um, can allow a search uh, without a warrant. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of exceptions there. Uh, to the warrant requirement. The other area of the Fourth Amendment uh, that is controversial has to do with how we enforce um, the warrant requirement, and we enforce that through the exclusionary rule. So this is a, judiciary, ju a judicially created principle. The exclusionary rule does not appear in the Constitution, but courts have articulated this rule over time, uh, and it reduces the incentive that police might otherwise have for violating search and seizure rights. And it's this idea, right, that if, if, if evidence is gathered illegally by the police, then it may not be admitted into court. So if the police just search your house without a warrant when you're not there and they find a whole bunch of evidence that you're committing a crime, well, that should be excluded from court under the exclusionary rule. Sure, maybe you're committing a bunch of crimes, but your attorney is going to make an argument that there was no warrant. They can't just go into your house and search all the houses and wait to find one that's committing a crime. Um, your conviction or your arrest will be thrown out. Your conviction will be overturned. Um, and so the idea is that this gives police a strong incentive to follow the rules, to follow the law, to follow the Constitution and not do things improperly. Because if they do things improperly, that evidence cannot be used in court to convict you. All right. So that's an important concept, the exclusionary rule, as a judicial check on, again, overzealous police officers. Um, law enforcement officials until the 20th century, though, didn't face the exclusionary rule. And so this happened all the time, where law enforcement would conduct illegal searches and seizures, and the, then the, that evidence could be used in court. Um, and you know, it was a way for the government to uh, find the bad guys without having any kind of probable cause at all. Um, the exclusionary rule, in this case, Weeks versus United States, um, uh, was first articulated at the federal level in this case, uh, excluded evidence uh, illegally obtained by federal agents after they entered uh, this person's house twice in one day to seize his property. They just, you know, they, they got a tip that he was doing something wrong, but they didn't have a warrant. They just went into his house over and over again until they found some evidence and um, seized it and tried to use it in court and the Supreme Court in 1914 said no you can't and articulated the exclusionary rule there. Um, and then uh, later on in 1949 the court again in Wolf versus Colorado um, talked about um, you know ex excluding evidence on the, on the uh, state level uh, however, what was interesting was sometimes you commit a crime at the state level and the federal level. You violated two laws. And what would happen is the state prosecutors would turn uh, that material over to the federal government. And even though the, so the federal government could use it in courts uh, because they're not the ones who had illegally seized it. And that was a so-called silver platter doctrine, that these other officials could turn it over to the other jurisdiction and they could use it. It was kind of a loophole in the law. Uh, but that was ultimately overturned in 1960. Uh, in the case of uh, Elkins. All right, so Matt versus Ohio, however, is the foundational case in the exclusionary rule area. And there's a photograph there of Dahl Ree Mapp, who was arrested in Cleveland. Uh, police conducted a warrantless search of her house. They barged in on her, um, and she was arrested. Because what did they find? They found obscene materials, right? She had uh, some pornography in her house, and so they arrested her, even though they had no warrant to search her house for any reason whatsoever. You know, and um, the court invoke the exclusionary rule um, for state government officials uh, and said that this is a deterrent safeguard uh, and without it the Fourth Amendment protections would be reduced. So oftentimes you see a lot of old, if you watch old movies, right, um, from before the time of Matt versus Ohio, a lot of these criminal procedure decisions didn't happen, as I said, till the mid or late 20th century. And so old black and white movies from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, you see the police doing things like beating up the suspects, breaking into people's homes, conducting illegal searches. They were able to do that kind of stuff back then and get away with it. Um, and that kind of evidence wasn't excluded in court. Today, it must be excluded. Okay, so... Um, now, just as we mentioned exceptions to the warrant requirement before, there are also exceptions uh, to the exclusionary rule. 
And that's because, again, the court has become more conservative over time. And so when the liberal justices of the 1960s and 70s left the bench and were replaced by more law and order minded conservative justices, um, some people thought the court would even overturn Matt versus Ohio and allow um, you know, illegally obtained evidence to be used in court. But so far, the court has not been able, the conservatives on the court have not been able to do that, uh, overturn Matt versus Ohio. But they have been able to scale back the exclusionary rule by creating exceptions to that rule. So the Calandra case from 1974, the justices said that the exclusionary rule did not apply to grand jury hearings. That's very interesting. Now, a grand jury, and we'll talk more about that uh, in the next uh, lecture, um, is not a jury, right, for a trial court to decide innocence or guilt. The grand jury has to do with uh, the prosecutor goes to the grand jury, asks for an indictment, uh, believing that someone's committed a crime. So they show the grand jurors a bunch of evidence, and the grand jurors look at that evidence and say, yeah, that person should be indicted, which means, yeah, we should go ahead and prosecute that person in court with a trial, with a jury to decide innocence or guilt. So in Calandra, the justices said that the exclusionary rule did not apply to grand jury hearings. That means that illegally obtained evidence can be presented to the grand jury. So prosecutors can say, yeah, we broke into this guy's house, we illegally obtained the evidence, uh, but look, the evidence shows that the guy's a criminal. And the grand jury can say, yeah, let's issue an indictment, let's go ahead and prosecute him. Now, the evidence can't be used at the trial, but it can be used to gain the indictment. That's quite an exception, quite an exception, okay? Um, and that's, again, uh, a new, relatively new development, development in the law by the conservative justices. The U.S. versus Leon is another very controversial part of exceptions to the exclusionary rule. This is a 1984 case where the court ruled that evidence seized by the police acting in quote-unquote good faith, good faith, uh, with a uh, warrant is admissible even if the judge erred in issuing the warrant in the first place. So think about that. The judge issues the warrant to the um, prosecutor, to the police, right? We want to go search somebody's house. The judge says, let me see your evidence. And the police say, well, we don't really have much evidence. We, you know, we have this rumor or whatever. And the judge says, well, yeah, that's probably good enough. If you, if you say he's guilty, he probably is. Here's the warrant. And it didn't rise to the level of probable cause. And so they go to your house. They find a bunch of stuff. They arrest you. In court, you, can, you could say, hey, the judge didn't have probable cause to issue that warrant. And it, after Leon in 1984, that doesn't matter anymore. Even if the judge didn't have probable cause, and issued that warrant improperly, if they find evidence against you, that evidence can be used in court. That is a major exception to the exclusionary rule and a major victory for conservatives and police officers and prosecutors in this country. Another exception in the same year, in U.S. versus Nix, the court established the inevitable discovery exception. Evidence discovered as a result of an illegal search can, it should say, can still be introduced in court if it can be shown that the evidence would have been found anyway. Think about that, right? So the police break into your house, they conduct an illegal search, right? And they find a bunch of evidence and they have no warrant. But let's say uh, in court they can show that, well, we could have gotten a warrant. We could have gone, we could have gone to the judge and, and gotten a warrant. We just didn't bother to do it because we had plenty of evidence to get probable cause to get a warrant. We just didn't do it. And so, you know, we would have done, if we, if we had done it, the judge would have granted the warrant, and then we would have found all the evidence, and the guy's guilty. And the Supreme Court has said, okay, that's allowed. So think about that. That's a huge exception that allows the police to not have to get the warrant if they know they can get the warrant. They can just go ahead and conduct the search. A major victory, again, for the police, for conservatives, and prosecutors. Another exception, Illinois versus Kroll, the court allowed evidence seized by police who conducted a search pursuant to an unconstitutional statute. So if the state legislature passes a law that allow police to do certain kinds of searches, even though that's unconstitutional, in other words, the Supreme Court finds later that that law is unconstitutional, but, but before they do that, police are acting on this unconstitutional statute and seizing a bunch of evidence, well, that evidence can be used in court then because it hadn't been overturned yet. By the Supreme Court. So another big exception to the exclusionary rule. Um, Hudson versus Michigan. This is a more recent one, 2006. The court considered the traditional knock and announce rule. This idea that the police come to your door, uh, they have a warrant, right, to search your house. They knock on the door, 
they can't just barge right in. They have to wait a reasonable amount of time for the occupant to respond to the knock before entering a home. Right? That's what the knock and announce rule is. That's what it has always been, had always been until 2006. This idea that you knock, knock on the door, wait for an answer, you know, a reasonable amount of time, you know, at least probably what, how long? 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds for someone to answer the door. If they don't answer the door, then you can go ahead and enter because you have the warrant. That's the knock and announce rule. But in Hudson, the court ruled five to four with the new conservative justices on the court, Roberts and Alito in the majority, that evidence found after entry with a valid search warrant need not be excluded if police violate the knock and announce rule. So if they have a warrant and they go to your front door, they don't have to knock on the door. They can come right in and seize the evidence and it can be admitted in court. A major change in the law. The knock and announce rule um, allowed some sort of privacy, some sort of time for you to get to the door, right? No, no longer. So another big exception, big victory for conservatives, prosecutors, and police officers. All right, so the debate over the Fourth Amendment and the exclusionary rule illustrates the highly politicized nature of judicial decision-making generally and of criminal law specifically. The court's search and seizure standards have evolved from the conservative physical penetration rule that we talked about, which is no longer applicable, to the liberal expectation of privacy standard, this idea that people should have an ex there is an expectation of privacy now that uh, should require warrants and probable cause. But opponents of the exclusionary rule argue that letting a guilty person go free is too great a price for society to pay just because the police officer violates search and seizure guidelines. So just because they didn't follow proper procedures with regard to warrants and probable causes and so forth, that doesn't mean that evidence should be excluded from trial and guilty people should go free. That, that doesn't make any sense. Um, at least that's been the argument of conservatives. And they have uh, conservative majorities on the Supreme Court have sustained those arguments. And so that's why we have all of these exceptions. Supporters fear that the, if the exclusionary rule is eliminated, which we're on the road to doing with all of these exceptions, police will have no incentive to respect the law and will return back to a time before the exclusionary rule, right, when police could pretty much get away with anything. As long as they find evidence of guilt later, they can do anything beforehand. A 1983 study, uh, and it's a bit dated, but uh, the data I've seen recently still proves, bears this out, uh, because the court talked about this in Leon in, in 1983, that between 1 and 2 percent of all felony arrests in this country are lost at any stage in the arrest disposition process, including trials and appeals, because of the exclusionary rule. The rate of lost arrest is somewhat higher in drug and other uh, possessory offenses, but much lower in violent crimes. So this idea is, out of for every 100 felony cases, meaning serious criminal cases, not misdemeanors like traffic stops, but serious felony cases involving violence, um, that, that sort of stuff. Okay, in, fel in felony cases, um, one out of one to two out of every 100 cases are overturned because the police didn't follow proper procedures. Well, that's not a huge percentage, but it does mean that one or two people who otherwise would be guilty of committing a crime do go free because police don't follow proper procedures. And you know, the more exceptions are allowed uh, to to these. Uh, um, requirements of warrants and exclusionary rules, then uh, the more likely these people won't be released, right? And we won't have actual criminals being released by courts uh, back into society. And so that's why America has, has chosen, basically in the last four decades or so, um, to move in that direction, in a more conservative direction, because they don't want uh, these folks back on the streets because of liberal decisions. All right, so um, we have a couple of minutes here um, to take some uh, questions. Um, if anyone wants to weigh in on the Fourth Amendment, we can certainly talk about that. Um, or we can go back to the First Amendment if there's any lingering questions you have there before we turn to the Fifth Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment is another criminal procedure amendment, largely, um, that we're going to spend a fair amount of time on. Um, and involves um, not only crim criminal procedure, but also the taking of private property by the government. And you might have heard about uh, that famous case, the Kelo case. So we want to definitely uh, spend time uh, on that here in a minute. All right. So Mike asks, what about the exigent circumstances? What do, what do we mean by ex What do you mean by exigent circumstances exactly? 
Oh, and meanwhile, uh, I, I remember there was someone right who asked about why why the exclusionary rule does not apply to grand juries, and we were talking about that before. Um, the exclusionary rule doesn't apply to grand juries because the court said it doesn't apply to grand juries. Um, you know, it's it's an important thing to understand that the Supreme Court um, has made itself the final arbiter of constitutional uh, adjudication in this country. Um, you know, we're supposed to have three separate branches of government, right? The executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. But the court over time has become more and more activist in terms of getting involved in uh, controversial cases, controversial areas, and, and trying to solve the issue for the country. And so that's what we have uh, with regard to the exclusionary rule not applying to grand juries. Basically, um, judges on the Supreme Court have said that it, grand juries can consider illegally obtained evidence, uh, they can consider rumor, they can consider third-party hearsay. So prosecutors can go before the grand jury and say, well, you know, I hear a lot of rumor, a lot of speculation. Um, indeed, we obtained this evidence illegally that, that confirms some of these rumors. And the grand jury can say, wow. That's, that's impressive. I think you should prosecute those guys. Let's hand down an indictment. And so um, that's the law. That's been the state of the law for quite some time in this country. So grand juries have a much, much more leeway in terms of what they can consider um, in terms of issuing indictments or not issuing indictments uh, compared to regular juries uh, for criminal trials in terms of innocence and guilt. Those juries cannot consider rumor or hearsay or illegally obtained evidence, except in those exceptions that we mentioned. All right, so um, maybe we should move on here a little bit to um, the Fifth Amendment uh, because it builds on what we've been talking about in terms of criminal procedure. Um, criminal procedure uh, involves a whole bunch of different areas, uh, the Fourth Amendment being part of it, but the Fifth Amendment contains also a number of criminal procedure provisions, and so does the Sixth Amendment as well. You can see there in the word, word cloud, we're going to talk about grand jury. We'll talk about double jeopardy, which is always a fascinating concept that a lot of people uh, are, are, have a lot of questions about, unsure about it. Self-incrimination. Uh, we'll talk about the Miranda rights, very famous. So the, while the Fourth Amendment is certainly important with regard to um, probable cause and search and seizure and the exclusionary rule, the Fifth Amendment uh, involves a whole number of provisions that, that tend to be a little bit more uh, famous. Here's a picture of, of the grand jury. You know, and, and, and a grand jury can consist of a lot of people. It doesn't have, you know, when we think of criminal trials, we think of criminal juries being a dozen, 12 people on the, on the criminal jury. Um, but the grand jury can be two dozen people. And um, the grand jury, and you can see there, of course, it's all men. This is an old one from 1913. All men on the grand jury. And they don't just sit in courtrooms and hear evidence and rumor and speculation and hearsay from the prosecutor. They can go out with the prosecutor to the site of the alleged crime or whatever and do their own investigating. So grand jurors are quite uh, powerful uh, in that sense. So let's talk a little bit more about the grand jury. As I said, it can, it can be anywhere from 12 to 23 jurors, and they're empowered to evaluate and investigate crimes within a jurisdic jurisdiction. The Fifth Amendment guarantees a grand jury review to anyone accused in federal court of a felony. And as I said before, these are serious crimes, right? Felonies are serious crimes, misdemeanors are minor crimes like traffic stops and those sort of things. Okay, So um, the idea here is that the uh, grand jury review, the, the protections of a grand jury provided for in the Fifth Amendment <coughs> are, are um, a check, again, against overzealous prosecutors who um, would otherwise want to prosecute you without any reason to do so. Um, here you have to have the grand jurors agree that there's a reason to prosecute and that is what they do when they issue an indictment. All that does is give the prosecutor the go-ahead to go ahead and prosecute you. Unlike trials, grand juries have much greater leeway in terms of what they can consider, as I mentioned before, rumor, hearsay, speculation, and yes, illegally obtained evidence um, based on recent Supreme Court law. The proceedings are run by the prosecution. Uh, witness testimony can be considered, but there's no defense attorney there. So it's a kind of closed proceeding where the prosecutor and the grand jurors get together. They're really, they're, there's really no uh, opposition there. So they're, they're, you know, the prosecutor and the grand jurors could get together and have a whole long discussion about whether to indict you, and you don't even know it. You're, you're not there. Your attorney's not there. You have no idea they're doing it all on their own. It's a closed shot in that sense. Very different from the actual criminal trial. 
All right, so generally, the uh, at least 12 of the grand jurors must vote for an indictment for the case to move forward uh, and the accused to be charged. So it doesn't have to be all the grand jurors, but it should be a majority of the grand jurors. So that makes it even easier. So you figure they're considering rumor and hearsay and speculation and illegally obtained evidence, and they only have to get a majority uh, in order for the uh, prosecution to continue. So it's pretty easy for federal prosecutors to get indictments from grand juries. You know, you imagine seeing a scare headline, right, uh, in, in the press that says, you know, so-and-so indicted, and you think, oh, my God, somebody was indicted. That sounds horrible. But what you realize now is that someone gets indicted by the federal government from a grand jury. What you realize is, well, gee, anyone can get indicted by a federal grand jury because they can consider rumor and hearsay and illegally obtain evidence. And so indictments don't mean anything. All the indictment is is an accusation of guilt, right? An accusation made by the prosecutor and the grand jury. That's all it is. It doesn't mean anything else. But I don't think a lot of people know that. And so if you see a headline that says so-and-so is indicted, you'll think, oh, my goodness, it's the end of the world. But it really isn't that big of a deal. Indictments returned by grand jury panels whose selection has been tainted by racial or sexual discrimination are dismissed. And so um, if it can be shown that grand jurors have excluded systematically racial minorities or women from the jury pool, the grand jury pool not being allowed to be grand jurors, then any indictments that they issue uh, can be thrown out. So um, you can't just pick anyone to be on the grand jury. Uh, it does have to be a cross-section of the community, broadly speaking, just like a regular criminal trial jury. All right. Um, critics of the grand jury system argue that it's not really a check on prosecutors because they have little restriction on what they can say and what they can provide to jurors. So those make indictments highly probable and more, than, uh, more of a formality than anything else. As a result, the practice of grand juries has been diminishing in most states, and in the federal courts, with more than half of the states having abandoned grand juries altogether. It's up to the states themselves to decide whether or not to have grand juries. The Constitution, the Fifth Amendment's guarantee for grand jury, only applies to the federal government. Um, so state governments can choose for themselves, and over time state governments have decided, we don't really want grand juries anymore because it's kind of a waste of time, it's expensive for taxpayers to, uh, you know, to constitute the grand jury and, and do all of this work. Let the prosecutors decide to indict on their own, or maybe the prosecutor just goes before a local judge and gets the indictment. Make it a lot easier that way, okay? Because they're not really a check to begin with, the grand jurors. So the Supreme Court ruled in the famous case of Hurtado versus California in 1884 that the grand jury protections are not required in state proceedings, making this provision one of the few guarantees of the Bill of Rights that only applies to the federal government, as I mentioned before. Um, so when we think of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, all of those First Amendment protections, those all uh, are held to the federal government and the states. But the Supreme Court said that the grand jury protection is not an essential part of due process and so therefore is not uh, something that states have to be required to do. So let's take a look at some of these uh, provisions beyond grand jury in the Fifth Amendment. Double jeopardy is one that people think about all the time. And students are always asking about the O.J. case. You know, isn't that double jeopardy because he was found innocent in the criminal trial or not guilty? And then uh, he had to go through another trial, a civil trial um, brought by the Goldman family. And uh, he was found liable for violating the Goldman family. Um, uh, this is uh, Ronald Goldman, one of the victims of the attack. Uh, the, the civil court said that O.J. Uh, violated his civil rights. So anytime you... Uh, commit a murder, you could be violating someone's federal civil rights and you could be sued in federal court. Uh, but that's not a criminal uh, case. OJ was tried criminally at the state level. The civil case takes place at the federal level uh, and it's um, a civil case. So it's for monetary damages. So they were suing OJ for money. That's what put OJ in such financial difficulties and why he had to really ramp up his memorabilia sales. And that, of course, led to ultimately his arrest. Uh, in Vegas and his current imprisonment for that. So um, double jeopardy uh, in the Fifth Amendment um, of the Fifth Amendment is it only prohibits what? It only prohibits a second prosecution after an acquittal of the same offense. So if you're found innocent or not guilty, uh, as uh, O.J. was in the criminal court, um, then the state can't come back and try you again. All right, that would be double jeopardy. Once you're found not guilty. That's the end of that. 
Okay, so that's what double jeopardy prohibits. It also uh, prohibits a second prosecution after a conviction of the same offense. So um, if you're convicted for a crime um, and you serve out your sentence, they can't go ahead and try you again for the same crime to try to get you in prison again. So it, it certainly uh, prevents that. And it also prohibits a punishment more than once for the same crime. So um, you can only be punished once uh, for, um, for the crime that you committed. It seems simple and clear, but again, there are complications, and I mentioned uh, the complication uh, being that a single criminal act may violate multiple statutes, and that can allow for multiple prosecutions. You might have violated state law, but you might have violated federal law too. And so if you violate a state criminal law and you're found not guilty there, but you've also violated a federal criminal law, you could be found guilty there. That doesn't violate double jeopardy because those are two separate jurisdictions, the state and the federal, two separate laws that you have violated, even though they may prohibit the same thing. And that's part of the American federalist system, right? We have a federal government and we have a state government. And those state governments have chosen to delegate powers to local governments. And so you have county governments, city governments, and state governments, and then also the federal government. And so if you've uh, violated an offense at the state level, let's say a state drug law, you can be prosecuted. Um, and you can also be prosecuted at the federal level for violating a federal drug law. Okay? That does not violate double jeopardy provisions. Um, mistrials generally allow for another trial. So this is another thing that confuses people. If during the trial the judge doesn't follow proper procedure or the jurors don't follow proper procedure and there is some sort of mistrial, right? the trial has to stop, um, you can be tried over again. And if this, during the second trial there are improper procedures, the trial has to stop, you can be tried again. You can be tried again and again and again. Maybe the trial even uh, concludes and the jurors come down with a verdict and you're found um, not guilty and, and, uh, or you're found guilty and you appeal to the uh, Court of Appeals and say that improper procedures were followed. And the Court of Appeals can say that's right. Uh, improper procedures were followed and so your conviction is thrown out, the state can choose to try you again. And so the state can keep trying you over and over and over again if they want, if improper procedures are followed. So we want the procedures to be followed um, the first time so that we don't have this problem of continuing to retry people. That doesn't violate double jeopardy. So uh, double jeopardy is only violated when the trial is conducted properly, not if there is a mistrial. First convictions that are reversed on appeal allow for another trial, and that's part of this whole idea that I just mentioned, that you can be uh, tried again if there's some reason for reversing your conviction on the, uh, at the Court of Appeals. Um, separate sovereignty prosecutions for the same offense are allowed. That's uh, what we were talking about uh, before. Uh, an acquittal in a criminal case does not provide immunity to civil action. That's the OJ uh, example there. So. Um, you can be uh, perhaps liable in a civil case for a criminal act that you uh, do. Uh, roughly 90% of criminal cases are plea bargained. Now think about that. Nine out of ten criminal cases do not go to trial. That means that the accused cuts a deal with the prosecutor. Right? The prosecutor says, look, we won't take you to trial, um, and what we'll do is we'll throw out some of the charges, and instead of 20 years in prison, we'll just give you three years in prison. But you have to plead guilty. You have to say that you're guilty. Um, and if you do that, then we'll reduce the charges and we'll drop your sentence. And so you say, okay, I'll, I'll plea bargain that. And, and that counts as a conviction. And so uh, even though you plea bargained, it's, it counts the same on your record as if you went to trial and the jury or the judge found you guilty. Double jeopardy rules apply just as they would for conviction by trial court, all right, because it counts the same way whether it's plea bargain or not. So it's not just that double jeopardy counts for trials. Double jeopardy counts for plea bargains as well. And that's the vast majority of criminal cases. Okay, let's talk about the self-incrimination provision. This is the whole idea that you have the right to remain silent, right? And we think about Miranda versus Arizona, the famous case from 1966, where the Supreme Court ruled very narrowly, five to four, a liberal Supreme Court ruled, right, that if you confess to a crime, that's not admissible in evidence uh, in a court of law unless you are verbally apprised of your constitutional rights before you give the confession, right? And so what that means is the court has to say to someone who is arrested, right, as soon as someone uh, is, is deemed a suspect by the police, right, and arrested, 
We know the famous Miranda rights. Um, and, you know, we hear them on TV. We hear them in the movies all the time. The police have to verbally tell you that you have the right to remain silent. That's self-incrimination, meaning you can't incriminate yourself. They can't force you to answer the questions. They can't force you to admit whether you're guilty or not. Okay? Um, you don't have to say anything at that point. So you do have the right to remain silent uh, once um, you're arrested. And if the police forget to tell you that you have the right to remain silent and you start confessing to the crime, those, crime, those confessions should not be allowed in court, right? Because you didn't receive your Miranda rights. And you have the right to an attorney and that sort of stuff. So all of these rights have to be given to you. And if they're not given to you, you could uh, potentially um, have a claim to get your conviction thrown out later. All right, so this is called Mirandizing. The police know about this. They learn about this. They have to Mirandize suspects uh, at the point where they are um, suspects, right? So that potentially anything they say could be used in court. If they don't Mirandize suspects and people start talking, that stuff is inadmissible. So once you get Mirandized, then the police can pretty much ask you anything. Um, and if you want, you can answer questions, but those things can be on the record and used against you. Uh, the Supreme Court is a very controversial decision, the Miranda decision, and conservatives didn't like it. For years, they wanted to overturn it. But in Dickerson versus the United States in 2000, a conservative Supreme Court uh, actually upheld it and said, look, the Miranda rights are so firmly ingrained in the law, they've been around so long that we have to um, allow it, okay? uh, keep it in place, because Americans have an expectation um, that these rights will be read to them, and they want to know uh, at the point with which uh, they're talking to police what can be used and what cannot be used. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll get to questions here in a second. I just want to wrap up here with a uh, couple more slides here on due process. Um, the administration of justice, uh, what is due process? It's the administration of justice. The Fifth Amendment guarantees due process. No person can be denied life, liberty, or property without due process of law. This is a very vague concept. You know, what do we mean? Well, basically what we mean is that you can't be denied life unless you get due process. Uh, meaning the government can't kill you. They can't just take your life for no reason. They have to give you due process first. And we call this procedural due process. They're going to get a procedure. And we know what that is, right? You're going to get an attorney. You're going to get a jury of your peers. You're going to get a trial, right? You're going to have the right to confront your accusers and so forth, to question witnesses and that sort of stuff. Okay, so that's procedural due process. Um, the Constitution guarantees that every um, person who's accused of a crime gets that procedural due process. Um, the government can't take your life without it. Um, they also can't take your liberty without it, right? To put you in jail, to restrain your freedom to move and so forth um, without uh, procedural due process. And life, liberty, and property. They can't take your property, right, without due process first. That's what the Fifth Amendment says. The Fourteenth Amendment says the same thing for state and local governments. Now, procedural due process is a fairly simple concept, right? That you're going to get these procedures whenever you're um, accused of a crime. But... Um, there's also this very uh, controversial area of, of due process, which is the substantive aspect of due process. This idea that um, there are certain areas, um, you know, when we think of life, liberty, and property, specifically with regard to liberty, certain liberties, certain freedoms that you have that are absolute that, or more absolute than others, uh, that you can't be denied even if you go through a, pr a process, a procedural process. Um, and we might think of civil rights, for example, as, as one example of that. And it's a very difficult concept, but the most important concept with regard to substantive due process is the right to privacy. Now, we mentioned it before in terms of expectation to privacy in the home with regard uh, to warrantless searches and the like. And that kind of expectation to privacy in Olmstead versus United States is something that the court picked up on uh, in, in the tw late 20th century. Liberal justices picked up on and said, you know, the Constitution creates a whole bunch of rights that seem to give rise to a general right to privacy. Go ahead and do a search. The word privacy does not appear in the Constitution. And so it is uh, something that the courts have said in the famous case of Griswold versus Connecticut from 1965. The uh, majority said these... Uh, the right to privacy uh, emanates from the specific guarantees of the Bill of Rights, like um, search and seizure provisions, right? You have a reasonable expectation of privacy of your person, right? The government can't pump your stomach for evidence. The government can't look inside your pockets, right, unless they have probable cause. Uh, and the home, another zone of privacy, certain expectation in the home. 
And so Griswold versus Connecticut was a case in 1965 about the use of contraception. Um, the state of Connecticut criminalized the use of contra contraception, and Planned Parenthood was providing counseling, um, marital counseling for um, you know married couples uh, who maybe didn't want to get pregnant right away, and so they were offering uh, advice about using condoms and other forms of contraception. But this violated Connecticut law. And so uh, are you going to prosecute the worker at Planned Parenthood and the married couple uh, for uh, engaging in this uh, use and discussion of contraception? And the Supreme Court said um, that, that there is a right to privacy that includes the marital bedroom that no government can criminalize. Okay? And so that really begins this very controversial area of the right to privacy, which is all based on substantive due process, this idea of liberties freedoms, rights that you have that even procedures can't take away um, that leads to Roe versus Wade. So with, with Griswold, then we get to Roe versus Wade. And so if contraception is allowed for marital couples, what about abortion, right? And the Supreme Court says in Roe versus Wade that there's a private relationship between a woman and her doctor that the state cannot infringe. The state cannot criminalize abortion at least in the uh, first uh, trimester of pregnancy. That's an absolute right of privacy between the woman and the doctor, and only in certain circumstances in the second trimester. And then in the third trimester, uh, when the fetus becomes viable, then the state has an interest in protecting the life or the potential life of the fetus at that point because it could live outside the womb, and then um, the state could, could ban abortion in the third trimester if it wanted to. So Roe versus Wade begins the uh, abortion debate that, of course, continues in America. But it's important to understand that the right to privacy includes the right to an abortion, and that comes from Griswold versus Connecticut, where we have the right to uh, privacy in the marital bedroom. Okay? The most recent example of this right to privacy, substantive due process, is Lawrence versus Texas. And this is the case where the Supreme Court struck down criminal sodomy laws. Um, that, that the Supreme Court said five to four with Justice Kennedy, the swing vote, calling, saying that uh, same-sex couples had a protected liberty interest to engage in private, intimate conduct, not unlike a married couple, right? So extending that right to privacy or that liberty interest to have a private relationship, intimate relationship with another person, and, and that no, no procedure can take away, no criminal law can take away Lawrence versus Texas, a major gay rights victory. Uh, for um, for that movement in 2003 at the Supreme Court. Now the final area, of course, is the takings clause, and you've heard a lot about this. You know, can the government take your private property for uh, for you know public use? And the answer is yes, they can. What the and this is the power of eminent domain. Eminent domain is inherent power that governments have to take private property. If the government needs to put up a military base, they can take your house if it's in the spot that the, that the military base needs to go on. Um, they can take your house um, under the power of eminent domain. What the Constitution does is it checks that government power. It says that the government can only do it if it's for public use. So they can't, you know, just take it for any reason. There has to be a public use to that property. And, of course, you have to get just compensation, which generally means fair market value. So um, the just compensation provision isn't that controversial in general. Courts say as long as the people are offered fair market value by the government, and the government usually offers more than fair market value just to make, make sure that there, there's no issue there with money uh, if they need property. Um, so that's not controversial. It's the public use part that tends to be controversial, um, very controversial even to this day. And so you can see in the three uh, leading cases here, Berman versus Parker from 1954, the Hawaii case from 84, and the Kelo case from 2005, in each instance, the the Supreme Court allowed the government to take property. In Berman, they said they could do it for aesthetic and beautification reasons. So if there was a blighted area of town, a kind of burned out, run down area of town, boarded up houses, the government could come in and take all that property in order to beautify the area and make it look pretty again. However, that maybe they want to put in flowers and parks or maybe whatever. Okay, So um, that was allowed. That was a pretty expansive use of eminent domain. Uh, and, and for a liberal use, right, this aesthetics and beautification. In the Hawaii case, they, uh, the court upheld a state plan to redistribute land by forcing large landowners to sell their properties to the people who leased that land. And that was interesting uh, because um, there were a few landowners in Hawaii that owned all the land and everybody 
uh, lived in Hawaii, was renting, and the rents were extremely high, and so the court said they could do that. Land re redistribution was allowed. And in Kilo, the most famous case, a uh, recent case, was um, that private homes uh, could be taken um, to put up a redevelopment plan, a Pfizer research facility, a hotel, a conference center, museum, restaurants, and shops. And these private houses, these women had lived in these houses for 100 years with their families. The houses were beautiful. They were beautiful uh, waterfront properties. But the government wanted to take them, just give fair market value and put in this business district. And the Supreme Court allowed it and said that that constitutes a public use. Business redevelopment constitutes public use and your house can be taken. All right, so we need to wrap it up. I know we're a little bit late and we have some uh, a few questions. So I'll go ahead and answer some questions now if there's anybody uh, who wants to weigh in on some of this? There's a whole lot, um, whole lot to talk about with this stuff. Um, there was a question about supposing a criminal uh, confesses to a crime and the police did not Mirandize him, but he already knows his Miranda rights because he watches cop movies. No, 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 no. The police have to verbally give you those Miranda rights. It's not that we can assume that you know them. No, we can't assume that. Um, the police have to verbally say that to you. And so anything that you say before you're Mirandized cannot be used in court. So that's why police are very quick to read you Miranda rights whenever they think you're a suspect. So they can get that out of the way and then they can um, you know, record what you're saying, take down what you're saying, and use it later in court. All right. So I'm sorry we've run out of time. I know we, uh, we could go on all night, but these PowerPoint slides are available on my website. I know Kate said she was going to make them available to your teachers as well. I have a lot of extra slides at the end of each one of these presentations that go in depth on a lot of the cases. You can review them on your own if you want to learn about more about any of the particular areas of the law. I provided you with those slides. Um, I certainly appreciate you uh, tuning in. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And, and um, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor at Northern Illinois University outside of Chicago. And if you come to college and you take constitutional law classes, uh, as an undergraduate student, this is what you do. Uh, we go over these areas of the law, civil rights, civil liberties, and um, cover the cases. And then you can decide, gee, do I really want to go to law school uh, by taking a few undergraduate political science constitutional law classes. All right. So I uh, appreciate uh, you tuning in, and uh, we'll see you next time.